and some eyeglass clinics and uh, sharing in schools the gospel. Uh, I had to stay a little bit longer than the rest of the team, and we've just been sitting around looking at scripture together and writing some songs together. And this is a song based on Psalm 27, so if you want to turn in your Bible to Psalm 27 to follow along with us, um, we're going to try to sing through this. So here we go. Good morning.
thought that was an appropriate way to start our service this morning. That uh, Psalm 27 is a, a very appropriate way to uh, start a corporate gathering. So uh, God really spoke to my heart uh, through that specific psalm, and um, it's amazing when you go through difficult experiences how God's Word uh, speaks to you very clearly. And um, if you would have asked me this a year ago, a lot of you know the story. We had a family that had tested positive COVID uh, on our return trip the last time. And I was asking the Lord, God, how can you be glorified in this? How could you be glorified just sitting in a hotel room waiting, you know, and not able to interact with anyone under quarantine? And lo and behold, I'm in that very situation a couple days ago. And uh, instead of watching TV for three days, you know, and I just, and I, I did watch the Rams football game, okay, in Spanish, but I watched the Rams football game. And so, um, but I began to say, I don't want to waste this time. I mean, it was a time in my life where I didn't get a lot of phone calls. Um, there was not a whole lot of distractions. And God just kind of birthed this song. And uh, our translator, Angel, and I uh, wrote that together. And it's amazing, um, you know, the people that God connected with, you know, just by being in that hotel room. And I want to I challenge you and encourage you in this. Um, if you're homebound this morning, if you can't even get out and do anything, you can't even leave your house, God still can use you. Um, God can use you. Uh, he used our ladies who made the little girls' dresses. Uh, we were able to give those away. Um, it doesn't matter what stage of life that you're in, God can still use the gifts that he's given you uh, to magnify himself. So, um, really interesting lessons God taught me this week, but I am glad to be back. So, very, <laughs> very glad to be back. And uh, just want to get started with some announcements this morning. Um, we do have a couple things up in the air that I'm going to ask you to pray about. Um, uh, first, though, our giving statements, we've talked about that the last couple weeks. If you want to pick some of those up, um, those are available uh, from Nikki. if you want to look into that. Uh, the mission team will be sharing tonight, and so uh, we've got one testimony. Brandon's going to share uh, one testimony this morning, and then the rest of the team will be presenting tonight. Uh, the Valentine's banquet is canceled, okay? So um, just with the craziness of the pandemic and you know, lots of things going on, so we just wanted to uh, to bring that to your attention again. Uh, let's see, deacon ordination, that's coming up. That's something we're real excited about. God has blessed us with some men uh, in leadership, and so on February 13th, that's going to happen. I'm, I'm assuming that's still going to happen. We haven't touched base over some of this, so, okay. And then uh, the Hermitage Youth Conference, Chris, anything you want to say about that, or... Okay, so letters will be coming forth as we get some information on that. Um, let's see. Uh, the promise, the Easter pageant, is uh, some of our, our key leaders are getting together after the morning service this morning just for a couple minutes to talk about how to move forward. Um, we, a lot of us want to move forward, um, but we want to do what's in everyone's best interest. We have a lot of people that are you know, super committed to pulling this off. We just want to make sure we've got enough time to do that. So uh, just pray for discernment in that. Um, we would appreciate that. And um, we're, we've listed that we're going to rehearse this afternoon, which we're still planning on doing that. If we don't do that, you'll get an email or just look on the website and we'll make sure you get that information. But at this point, we, we have, uh, it's in the, in the bulletin, so... I want to go ahead and stay focused on this particular psalm this morning. So why don't you stand with us? And uh, this is the psalm that we sung about earlier, Psalm 27, just the first six verses. Let's read these together. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, 
that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. He will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. I am so grateful to be back with you, singing with you. And let's lift our voices up to the Lord this morning and give him praise. You ready, you ready to do that? Here we go.
Okay, let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. We are so grateful, so thankful that we have the promise of your return. And we're praying, Father, and asking for your Holy Spirit to move upon us today as a congregation, preparing us as your bride of Christ, just as we sang this morning. Father, we humble ourselves before you, We recognize, Father, that without your salvation in our lives, we would never make it to spend an eternity with you. And you've given that to us through Jesus, our Savior. And so, Father, we come before you and we ask that you would move and work upon our hearts, our lives today. Father, I also pray for those that are watching, whether it be on Facebook or the Internet or uh, live streaming or however it may be, I pray today, Father, that their hearts are challenged. I pray today, Father, that they would set aside other things in their homes to just zero in and tune in to what you may say today and speak to their heart. Father, we pray for healing in the lives of those that are going through some very difficult health uh, issues today. And for those, Father, in the very near future that will be going through some surgeries, whether it be knee surgeries, or whether it be for testing or uh, for other procedures, we pray, Father, for uh, you to be at work in their bodies physically. We acknowledge that you're a great God, you're a healing God, and you're a God that loves us enough that you want to spend eternity, you want us to spend eternity with you. And so, Father, our desire as a church is that you would be honored in this way as we give ourselves to you and we worship you in spirit and truth. And Father, we ask these things and pray in the awesome, mighty name of Jesus. And the people said, Amen. Amen. I'm not going to ask you to uh, greet uh, each other this morning. You can turn, wave, look at people, wink at them, smile, whatever it is that you do, uh, what you feel most comfortable with doing. seated. We want to welcome you. We are so glad that you're here. What a joy to be able to worship today. I hear there's going to be a heat wave from what we've been experiencing. And so uh, and I, I will say the only disappointment about coming back to the U.S. is that we left about 90, 95 in the, in the day to about 70 in the evening temperatures. Almost perfect. And uh, when Roger Cowan picked us up, there was ice all over everywhere. And uh, But I am glad to be back. And I wanted to say personally, thank you for your prayers. Uh, we saw a lot. You're going to be hearing testimonies tonight. You'll hear some this morning with Brandon. Uh, you've already heard the testimonies of, through a song that was, has been written uh, of just what God has done 
your help in your giving, those spatulas and those dresses that you made and the t-shirts and all of these kind of things, the Bible lessons that were taught, uh, the many Bibles. We had people that came and wanted the Bibles more than they wanted the glasses. And um, because you're giving, you enabled us to be able to say, yes, we'll give you a Bible. And um, uh, it was just a joy to see God do some things in the lives of people. And also to have four or five new uh, church family people with us and to see God use them the way he did. That's just absolutely incredible. Uh, to me, I always enjoy that aspect, that part of that. So to say thank you uh, for what God's doing. And thank you for your prayers that you've, uh, uh, that you've offered to us during this time. I know God has some great things in store. I want to, want to say happy anniversary to Don and to Barb. Um, 62 years. Now, uh, amen. 62 years. I know, I know that there may be some others here that have had many years like that. But for those of you young couples uh, thinking of getting married or are just getting married, if you want some advice... Uh, you'll want to talk to Barb, not Don, okay? <laughs> I talked to him already, and it wasn't Don's jokes that got uh, them through 62 years. It was Barb's enduring those jokes, okay? And so there are things here that... Uh, but we, what, what a joy. I think that every young couple needs to find that older couple and be able to just say, help me, because I want... I want when I said, uh, I, I want you as my wife or... I want you as my husband. When those words are spoken, and you, you're meaning that at that moment, at that time, there will be some challenges in your life. And I'm telling you, it's happened to all of us at one time or another. How did they do it? And so those are the things. And I just encourage the, those of you who are younger, don't be afraid to ask us, uh, these older couples, how did you do all those years together? Because I want that for my life and for my, my marriage. God's a good God. He's a great God. I know we have visitors with us. We do have some visitors' cards. Uh, they're guest cards that we have, and we would really like for you to fill those out. And so if you're visiting first time with us this morning, um, we're glad that you're here. We welcome you. If we can help you in any way, pray for you, or if God has spoken to your heart, there'll be a time toward the end of our service where you can respond and just praying, or you're asking, we'll pray with you, uh, or any other thing that you may have. So we're glad you're here. And we welcome you. Hope you'll come back tonight to our mission emphasis and hear just what God has done personally through our church family. You know, I mentioned this, it must have been two or three trips ago, but I hadn't heard a peep when I mentioned this, okay? In, in El Salvador, their worship time might go 45 minutes. And that is, there's not a single person that said amen right there, okay? So, uh, now we wanted to at least bring the joy back with us. So we're going to sing and celebrate it. So let's stand together and we'll sing together. Here we go. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, again I say, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, again I say, rejoice. Here we go. Four, one, two, three. Come 
just want to thank you, Pastor Norm, thank you. Thank you for all the prayers. Uh, we could definitely sense that our church family was praying for us there and seeing God move in every member on the team. And we owe that to our church family praying for God's faithfulness. Uh, you know, preparing to go was a, a faith exercise for me where I can look back now and see that God was showing me what biblical faith looks like. You know, when, when God tugs in our heart and puts a desire to go where he's calling us to go, to the mission field or to the next door neighbor, uh, stepping out and teaching Sunday class, school class, you know, you have to act on God's tug on your heart and promise in the word and move in the direction of where God's calling you to. And so the preparation to go was just say, Lord, if you open the door, I'm going to walk through it. No matter the cost, no matter the circumstances, I'm going to walk through it. And so God opened the door. Door after door, any obstacle that seemed to stand in the way, God opened the door and I walked through it. God was good. So preparing to go was just learning to trust the Lord and go. No matter the circumstances. You know, when you think of mission, there's risk involved. Um, you know, I think of what David said in Second Samuel 24, verse 24. He said, "I will not offer, I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with false images." Following Jesus has been a cross that's heavy, and it should. He paid the ultimate price on the cross to redeem us. I mean, we should owe, we owe him our all. So, God opened the door. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it's the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Proverbs 19, verse 21. Counting the cost, and that's that verse I read to you, when David said, I'll not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. Uh, three things I learned in El Salvador. The, the importance of the body of Christ. Those who were here praying for us and sending us making the dresses and everything and encouraging us to follow the Lord and making that possible. And the importance of working together. Every team member had the mind to work and serve God no matter what the task was. And just the unity, the unifying purpose of the gospel and making much of Jesus just made that an awesome thing and to see God working in each and every one's lives and in making much of Him. And then, on the other side, seeing our brothers and sisters there and being encouraged by their pastors and their workers in El Salvador, you know, and how they were just so welcoming to us in this church that we shared in on Sunday, it made us realize we were family. And it was so, it was a blessing to us as much as being a blessing to them to see that they were hungry to share the gospel with their people. And, you know, it's 
know how to stop and when to stop and what is okay. And, you know, spiritually, we're supposed to be children of God who go and win kids for our son. So, and another thing, working together. Seeing these two children of God open and have that mutual love and encouraging one another. And then worshiping in the face of uncertainty. certain his promises are sure and he can stand on those promises. So we can worship God in the face of trials and difficulties. And we learn that a lot. I'm thankful to go and I encourage you if God is calling you to go. The mission starts when you open your eyes in the morning. It's in El Salvador. It's in Walmart. It's here right beside you. It's encouraging one another to run the race that Christ has set before us. And he's the author and the perfecter. Thank you. So this uh, this song Brandon's going to sing that goes with the slideshow. Um, ran across this song. We were in a van traveling with one of our translators, and this song came on the air by Sayla. And it's from the Insanity of God movie that was that came out several years ago. It's it's called We Must Not. Very interesting title. You'll see the text as Brandon sings, and I think it will uh, it will encourage you uh, to be in season and out of season, but never you know missing an opportunity to give the hope uh, for the the reason of the hope that we have. So let's let's watch this, and Brandon's going to sing it. Come now, let us reason together. There is work to be done. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of evil around us. I can feel the darkness coming on. It's coming on strong. But the father's love is deep and still, and the whole wide world is a mystery. Take my hand, let's hold each other up. Come now, let us reason Let's not keep the gods 
Amen. Brandon, that, that was powerful. Amen. Let me just say, too, that uh, we are planning another team that will be going in, uh, in uh, the last of, of July, the 1st of August. And so we would love to have you with us. If God speaks to your heart, then we're you're so excited about, uh, about the possibilities of what God can do. It's one of the best discipleship tools that I have seen in, um, in 43 years of ministry is uh, to be able to take um, people, young and old, on a mission trip and let them see what God will do, what He has promised in His Word that He's already going to do. Now, here's my encouragement to those that's been on the team. Don't, don't lose that. Use that here. To whom much has been given, much is required. That's what the Scriptures teach us. And so now we have, we're responsible because you've seen God personally do some things in, a, uh, in another country. God does not have any geographical boundaries uh, where He has said that you can't do that here. And so let God use you and be faithful. And we've seen many of our church leaders have been on these mission trips and have taken great responsibilities within our church. And we want to continue to develop that. And so we invite you to go on the next trip that we have. I am reminded of, uh, of uh, what happened when I was in uh, the Dakotas last year. Uh, one of our students, um, Ethan Bradshaw, came to me and he said, I... I should, I should be going on that trip. And uh, God was dealing with Ethan back then. And, well, he finally went. And I'm telling you, wow, what a powerful um, way that God used him. And I'm just excited about that, that, that God spoke to his heart at a certain time uh, in a service. And he recognized that. And he started making the plans then to move forward in those kind of things. And so that's why I'm throwing that date out to you at this point, at this time, is that uh, in uh, July and August, we'll be heading again uh, into these areas. We've uh, had a group that, have, uh, that went and surveyed a new area that we're going to, an area that I've been to, Karen's been to, but none of our team has ever been to. It's on the side of a volcano and uh, a community of about 30,000 people. So it's a tremendous opportunity for us again to do some great ministry. If you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning. This is a series of messages that uh, I'm speaking on from the chapters 24 and 25 of the book of Matthew. It has to do with the return of Christ and uh, what the Bible has to say about it. These chapters contain more, the, more about the end times from the lips of Jesus himself than any other uh, section of Scripture. We have the book of Revelation that gives to us from John, as John was led by the Spirit of God. But Jesus gives to us two chapters here. One of the longest messages, the only longer uh, message that Jesus preached was a message that's in um, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. But it's, it's predominantly a message about the end times. And so if you'll have your Bibles uh, and you'll stand with me, I want us to look together at these passages. This is the third uh, section of this uh, that I've preached on. I believe that God gives to us some great truths here, and it ought to be an encouragement to all of us. Notice what it says here. I'm going to read verses <clears throat> 1 through uh, 3 to kind of set the stage here, and then we'll start in verse 15. Okay, notice what he says. Um, it says, Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these, do you, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus uh, answered them, and, uh, and then he gives to them, starting in some detail. I want us to start at verse 15 because I've already covered the previous verses. It says, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet, of, prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what... Um, to take what is in his house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak or his coat. And, and alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great 
tribulation. Such, this is an important verse here, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And in those days, uh, had not, if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. And if anyone says to you, look here, is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For the false Christ and the false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to, to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So, if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. And then just let me read a couple more verses here to you. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. This is immediately after that. The sun will be darkened, the moon will give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This is the second coming of Jesus, not the rapture of the church. This is the second coming of Jesus. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. It's the return of our Savior, to reign and to rule over our world. Let's pray together. Father, we, we stand before you, and I pray that you give us ears to hear, to understand just what we've read. I know there's much confusion at times as we have read your word, but Father, you remind us that through the power of your Spirit, you can give to us clarity of thought. And I'm asking for you to give me the words to speak to your people today in order that, Father, what I say and what I speak makes sense to their hearts, to their souls, through your Spirit, drawing them to yourself. May you be honored, may you be glorified, because it's about you, Father, and what you're doing in the world that we're living in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. What a great passage of Scripture. I know that it's confusing, it's difficult at times. And so, when we look at these passages, I, I want to point out just a few things to us to help prepare us. Prophecy is a major theme of this passage. It's obvious when we read this here. And of the Bible. There are about 300 different references just in the New Testament of the second coming of our Lord. And for every prophecy about Christ's first coming, Jesus coming as a baby in Bethlehem in a manger, all of that, there's three times more, more, more scriptures giving to us about his second coming, his return of the 27 books of the New Testament. <coughs> 23 have direct references. I mean, direct references to the second coming of Jesus. Now, this is a huge topic. There's a lot that we can look at, and so it deserves a really an in depth. That's why I'm trying to go through this a little uh, at a little slower pace. It may take us longer than what I anticipated, and especially with some interruptions that we've already had. But God knows. God knows that you needed the messages that was given in these past weeks, and praise the Lord for a church that has a, a, that's an elder led, uh, where we have men and pastors and preachers that can preach and step in and preach and teach the Word of God if others can't. And we ought to be grateful, thankful for that. But I can't answer all the questions about your uh, prophecy questions that you may have. I, I wish that I could, but I can pray about them and we can look and search the Scriptures. There's not one place in Scripture where it alone gives to us every detail because it is, as I mentioned, in many, many different books of the Bible and we have to pull all of these together to get the full picture and an understanding of what the Bible is speaking about. And so there's differences of opinions about these things. I mean, you just all you have to do is look at some different scholars. But there are some things that we know for sure. And uh, those things that we know for sure, here's three of them. Uh, and one is that we, we can know the general time, but not the precise moment that Jesus is coming. We, we know that. 
in verse 36 of this passage. We'll get to this in the weeks to come. Uh, when we talk about the rapture of the church, it says, But of that day and that hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but the Father only. So we know that. So there's no reason for us to speculate. And for those that have, uh, um, those authors that have written books and have, have tried to pinpoint dates and different things like this, uh, this passage of Scripture tells us and reminds us that we should not pay attention to that kind of stuff. Be careful. The second thing is that Jesus will return at a time when the world is completely unprepared. And I would say we're unprepared. We're looking in the wrong direction for all the answers for things. Uh, this morning, there are many people that are extremely fearful. We've just read a passage of scriptures. Rich led us in our, in our congregational scripture reading. That passage of scripture says, Whom shall I fear? Who, who am I to be afraid of? We have a God that loves us. He, he, and when, he, when we say that, even he's talking about disease, sickness, any other things that may be there. And so the Bible makes it, it a plain. And so uh, we, we should be prepared. In verse 50 of this chapter, it, it tells us the master of the servants will come on a day when he does not expect them. And at an hour he does not know. And so we, we can rest assured that, uh, that that's where our world is. We know that. And then the third thing would be that believers are called to be prepared. And um, Jesus gives that reference again in verses 42 and 44, that he says, if you, if you understood when the thief was going to come, you would be prepared. He's not talking about our Lord being some kind of a, a mean, evil thief that's breaking in or something, but he uses a comparison with this to stay awake. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming, is what Jesus says. And that's important. And I, I just want to point out to you, because sometimes this is, uh, this is uh, taken wrong when we talk about prophecy. We talk about in, in day time uh, issues. Uh, Bible prophecy is not to scare us. It's not to scare us, but it's to prepare us. There are great truths that we look at here. And as a believer, we can rejoice in those things. I have heard people say, I don't read the book of Revelation because it scares me. The Word of God should never scare you. It ought to encourage you as a believer. When we have our assurance in Christ Jesus and what He does and what He's done for us and how He's at work in us, then we should be encouraged that He's coming. That's why the early church used those words, Maranatha. It was an Aramaic term that, that referred to, come, Lord Jesus. And so it became a greeting. It wasn't just something that a preacher was preaching. Uh, it became a typical greeting in the church. Because when they would meet each other, they would say, Maranatha. They would say, Lord Jesus, come. And when they left each other, they would say, Lord Jesus, come. They were anticipating the soon coming of our Lord. And we should be the same. It is to prepare us, not to scare us. So you read the Word of God. You study the Word of God. And you will understand it in a great way. When we look at these things, we notice in these first few verses that I read to you, uh, and as I shared with, the, shared with you these things, Jesus is coming out of the temple area. It is a beautiful, unbelievable air, area. Herod the Great spent uh, millions of dollars in the building and the structures that was there. It was, it, was, it was a wonder of the world. People came from all around to see the beauty of this great place. And the disciples said to Jesus, you, you look at these beautiful buildings. You notice all of these buildings here? The temple was in the middle and all around it was these column. Uh, colonnades that was uh, put there and beautiful structure that was there. Very, very pretty and, uh, and just picturesque, the whole setting there. And he says to them, yes, I, I see these things and I say to you that uh, there will not be one of these stones that are left upon another. We know that uh, in 70 AD, the Romans, under the leadership of Titus, one of the rulers came in, he destroyed the of the temple area, and for the next, about the next 20 to 30 years, continually came in and literally took the entire city apart, destroyed every bit of it. It took them quite a while to do all of that, but they did that. And uh, so as they leave that area, and they're moving across to the, uh, to the Mount of Olives, which was, oh, maybe uh, uh, three-quarters of a mile to a mile across this valley and up on that uh, uh, ridge that was over there, and they were overlooking the city. Jesus sat down at the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came to him privately. No others were there, just those apostles or those disciples. And they asked him questions. And those questions that they asked him is, when? Tell us more about that. Basically, they, they asked uh, three different questions. When will these things be? And 
And what will be the sign of your coming? And, and what will be the sign of the end of, of the ages? And so there's three different areas that Jesus uh, talks about here. Now, the thing about it that we need to understand is that Jesus does not answer their first question first. He answers the second question, uh, when will these things be? And he does that, uh, he answers the first question later on in verse 36. And so when we look at this, it's kind of as, as though uh, there's uh, three different uh, 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 areas of things that are going on. When you read the book of Revelation, if you don't understand, you have to ask the question, where is this taking place? In the book of Revelation, is this something happening on the earth? Is this something going on in the sky? Uh, and who is it happening to? Is it happening to the Gentiles? Is it happening to uh, the Jewish people? What you will find from chapter 6 all the way through about chapter 19 is one missing group of people, the church. You have to ask the question, why? Why was the church not there? Well, in the weeks to come, I'm going to share with you why it wasn't there. And so what we find here is, as Jesus is sharing, he's speaking here and he's talking about three particular groups of people. And, and, uh, one, uh, and, and so, you know, when we look at this, all of the Bible applies to us, but not all of the Bible was addressed to us. So what I'm saying is that the Bible gives to us, all of it uh, is for us. We read it and God speaks to us through it, but at the time it was given, it wasn't all addressed to us. And so we ask the question, who then is this addressed to? Well, it's obvious it was addressed to the, the disciples. They were asking the question. It's obvious they would, it was addressed to the nation of, of Israel. And that's what I want to focus on today is that because it speaks about that. But it's obvious that it was also mentioning other groups of people that were here. And so in the previous weeks, I've shared with you that verses 4 through 14 are about the Gentile nations. The reason I say that is because the word nations are used about four or five times there. Not speaking about the Jewish people, but about the nations, the, the, the ethnic uh, language groups of the world. And, and it gives to us the signs of what, what's going to take place among the nations. And so the disciples, Jesus was making them aware, is to look at the world around us, because that will be affected. It's not just about the Jewish nation. They didn't quite catch it here because in the book of Acts, in the first chapter, they were still asking, when's the kingdom coming? And speaking about the nation of Israel only. Just like many of us, what we're focused on, we're not focused on the nations of the world. We're focused on what's happening in my area, in my county, in my state, uh, in the United States. We don't think of the uh, other countries of our world. But here Jesus addresses that issue. And in verses 15 through 35, he talks about the Jewish nation. And that's what we're going to be looking at uh, this morning, some of the things about that. The reason I say that is because he talks about a reference to the, to the prophecies of Daniel. He talks about uh, the temple. He's talking about Judea. He's talking about the Sabbath day, things that only those Jewish people would have understood. The Gentile world wouldn't have understood what was being said. They, didn't, they could care less about a Sabbath day or the elect or any of these kind of things. And then in verses 36 through 51, I believe he's talking about the church, and we'll, we'll look at that. We'll discuss those things in times to come. So these are all signs of the times of our, of our last days. And so uh, two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, last time I preached on this, we talked about the signs for the nation of Israel, or the nations uh, uh, around Israel. And today we're going to focus on the nation of Israel. And so as we look at this, I want us to look together and let's think about these kind of things that are being done. So here's the first point I would say about this passage of Scripture. Devastation will come to the nation of Israel in the future. Now, we can, we can look at this and some would say, well, now, now, hold it just a minute. Didn't it already happen to Jerusalem in 70 A.D.? Isn't that a fact? Yes, it did. But not to the devastation that Jesus is talking about. Not to, the, not to that extreme point. Matter of fact, this happened over 40 times to the nation uh, of uh, Israel and to the city of Jerusalem. It's been destroyed 40 different times. And uh, so when we look at this and we understand, and so in these verses here, I just want us to walk through some of these passages of Scripture. And, and I want you to notice that in the future, Jesus is saying, here are some signs that we can be looking at and we can be thinking about and we can be searching for. One of those is that Jerusalem will be attacked and destroyed. Now, 
Again, it says here, so when you, and the emphasis on you is not just for you as disciples, but you of that day and us in a prophetic time into the future, we would, when we see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel. That's an interesting statement. Uh, and he talks about uh, uh, the, de- the destruction of Jerusalem and these kind of things. Is, you know, the, the name Jerusalem means the city of peace. But uh, in, the, in the history of the city of Jerusalem, it was not a city of peace. It was constantly, uh, and has constantly, still up to, uh, uh, up to these days that we're living in, a city where there's much turmoil. You know, the reason is because uh, it's a city with three of the major world religions that all claim it to be the center of their focus. The Jewish world looks at Jerusalem as the capital of, uh, of uh, the Jewish race of the Jewish people. The Christians look at Jerusalem as the city of where their Savior uh, was crucified and He rose again. And and so the church is birthed out uh, of that environment, of that Jewish culture. That's why uh, in our country we call many of our what used to be our laws Judeo-Christian. It was Old Testament uh, teachings along with Christian teachings. Uh, but the but the emphasis is that that it was surrounded around the, the teachings and the emphasis of what was going on in Jerusalem or the or the country of Israel. But there's another group of people that call it their capital, the Muslims. And you'll see in just a moment as I walk through that and I share with you some of these things. And so we see all of these kind of things taking place. And, uh, and, and I think a key word for you to look at and to focus on is the word abomination of desolation. What does this term mean? I mean, in, in the scope of, uh, of the end time, in the scope of Jesus' return, what, what does that word mean? It seems to be an emphasis, it's emphasized uh, in the book of Mark, it's emphasized in Luke's gospel, uh, it's, it's, it's mentioned in the book of Daniel three different times. It's mentioned in the, uh, in the book of Revelation. All of these kind of things. But what, what does that boil down to? Well, Daniel mentioned it in his three times, and that's what Jesus is referring back to. He's referring to a time when an idol uh, was set up in the place of the true worship of God. It was a temple. It was their holy temple. And there were times throughout the history of the nation of Israel where they put idols within the temple. And it was an abomination. And, and when Daniel was speaking about this, he was talking about even an event that was going to take place in the future, too. And so, and, and we do know that before the birth of Jesus in the year 163, 167 B.C., that the Anarchist Epiphanes was a, uh, a ruler of the Roman uh, armies, went into Jerusalem. When he went into Jerusalem, he went into the temple and he put a statue of the emperor within the temple that people would worship. He not only did that, but then he took a pig and he offered a pig as a sacrifice and then he forced the priests that were there to drink uh, the blood of the pig and to eat the meat of the, of the pig which was an abomination. It was a desecration of the holy temple of God at that time. If you want to know more about that period and what took place there, there was a man by the name of Judas Maccabees, and uh, his father was a priest and a leader of the nation there, and they rebelled, and for a period of time, one of the only smallest armies in the world defeated the Roman government for a, for, for a period of time, about a hundred years or so, wars and fighting was going on until the Romans just a- absolutely came in once again and, uh, and they demolished and they, and they got rid of them. You can read it in the apocryphal books of the book of 1st Maccabees and 2nd Maccabees. It's not in our New Testament in the history because it's in that inner period where there's 400 years of silence where God didn't speak and give revelation to the Word of God from the time of Malachi until the time of the birth of Jesus. There's a lot of history there. I don't want to confuse you. I don't want to bore you. I don't want to bog you down with these things. But Jesus is saying there's coming a time and it's going to happen. And so that happened there. But let me tell you something else that happens. According to the book of Second Thessalonians, this event will happen again. 
You can go back and you can read through that, you will find. And that's why I say you have to pull lots of scriptures together. That in the future, the temple, uh, there's going to be a rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. It's not there now. I'll show you and share with you some things. And so the prophecies that are given, we could say yes, well, they refer to that time because the Romans did go in and they destroyed uh, the Jewish people. And they destroyed the nation of Israel. They destroyed, uh, and it wasn't a nation again from that time when the temple was destroyed and the nation was destroyed until 1948 when God brought them all back together. Something significant about the nation of Israel being pulled from all the nations of the world. Jesus talks about that. You'll see some of these kind of things. Again, when you start putting together, when we're looking at prophecy, and you have 23 of the 27 books of the New Testament, and there's references here and there's references there, it's like putting together a puzzle and getting them in the right pieces, uh, in the right place. Oftentimes, this is what we will do. We will take that and we'll try to force something into an area We will, uh, without looking at the full context of the historical arguments. I know there are people who would certainly disagree with where I'm at, and that's all right. I don't mind if they want to be wrong. No, no I'm not that arrogant to say I know, and I know all the truths of these things. But I want to tell you what I do know. That again, we follow the Scriptures and what it has to say. And there is coming a time when a temple is going to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. Matter of fact, you know, as we look at this passage of Scripture, there was a warning that he was given to them. He was telling them that uh, when these kind of things happen, you, the, you, you don't grab uh, uh, all of your, your, your best china, and you don't grab all of your jewelry, and you don't grab this, and you don't grab... You just get out. Now, while we were in El Salvador this time, uh, we were sitting in our rooms... Rich will remember this. I know my wife will. All of a sudden, the entire building was shaking. I'm thinking I'm on the second floor. Rich is on the first floor and could be here any time. I mean, from the ceiling down. Everything was shaking. Now, they will tell you that in that earthquake, you don't say, grab your suitcases and get all your stuff together and get out. It's the same as when they're saying, okay, um, if we have problems on an airplane... Forget about getting your luggage, get your oxygen mask on, and hang on. This is what Jesus is making reference to here, is that during that time, uh, we're going to forget about all of the other things. You may say, and not me, I, 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 I want to I make sure I get all my stocks and bonds, and, and I want to take, take, take a last look at my, uh, my retirement funds, and, 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 and old Sadie the cow, I want to make sure that, that she's doing well, and she's fed and, and, and whatever else. Now, there won't be time, and Jesus is saying, don't, don't, don't go there. Don't do that. Don't, don't spend that kind of time like that. In Luke 20, 21, 20, notice what it says here, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. Now, this happened in 1967. About uh, ten different nations came around the city uh, or the nation of Israel. And they were going to wipe Israel off the map. That was their intent. But I want to tell you, you cannot take the plans of God and push them aside and they be, uh, and, and, and put man's ideas in there. It didn't happen in 1967 when there literally were tens of millions of, of Muslims completely surrounding the entire nation of Israel. There was what they called the six or the seven day war. That's all that has only lasted that time. At that time, the, the capital, the city of Jerusalem, was split in half. Half of it was controlled by Muslims. The other half was controlled by the Jewish people. And after, as a result of that, this small group of soldiers in Israel pushed back literally millions of Muslims, and they pushed them all the way back over the Jordan River, they pushed them all the way back up into the mountains of the Golan Heights. They pushed them back all the way to the nation of, Israel, of Egypt and pushed them all the way down uh, into other areas south of the nation of, of uh, Israel. Small army. They weren't defeated. It didn't happen. Why? Because God has a plan, and His plan will be fulfilled, just like He has a plan for you, 
And if you're not cluing in to what God is saying in your life, first of all, would be your salvation, making sure that you have Christ as your Lord, and you know that He, uh, he that you have trusted Him, He spoke to your heart, you repented of your sins, you're following Him, because again, it's not to scare us, but to prepare us. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for our world. The world that we're living in. He has a plan for the nation of Israel. And so we see these passages. We can find them all over within the Scriptures. And we can see them. But let me just tell you that you can't overlook this passage here that says that this is the beginning of the Great Tribulation. It's, it, it is a passage of the wording of it is set for, this isn't just tribulation time, hard, difficult times. This is the great difficult times. We refer to that as the seven years of tribulation. Chris alluded to that last week in his message on Sunday evening. I'm going to be preaching somewhere in the near future here. Uh, on Daniel chapter 9, exactly what he refers to in the desolation uh, of, uh, of this, and he's talking about this, and about the 70 years or the 70 weeks that Daniel talked about. And so within it you will find historically the dates and everything that, will, that match completely up except for seven years. And those seven years, God stopped at a point, and He will start them again. I believe it was at the at the beginning of the church age. Those those seventy weeks, I should say, seventy weeks, not years, seventy weeks. I have four hundred and ninety years stops when the church was birthed, and it starts back up at the rapture of the church. And there will be so the book of Revelation talks about from verse chapter six to about chapter nineteen, seven years. All that takes place in that part is just seven years. You find the references in it all over. You find it in forty-two weeks, three and a half years. It's broken up into two different sections. There is a seven years of wrath coming, and that that was all taking place. Now, let me just uh, point out to you. A couple other things here that, that, that I, I, wanna, I want you to understand. This is the city of Jerusalem as you see it now, okay? And that big silver or that big gold part there is what's called the Dome of the Rock. And that Dome of the Rock is setting on top of where the temple used to set, the Jewish temple. Now, the Muslims put that there intentionally. You know why they put that there? So that the Jewish temple could not be rebuilt. But do you know that there's already, there have been projects going on for about 20 years or more of rebuilding a Jewish temple. Now, in 1967, when that war took place, the entire nation of Israel took over complete control of Jerusalem. Now, they've left the Dome of the Rock there. I've been inside of this Dome of the Rock. You go into this huge thing. It's, it's, uh, you, can, you can put... Um, hundreds of thousands of people around this on the top of the top area. It's flat, and oftentimes, at certain times of the year, Muslims will gather there, and uh, they will face Mecca, and they will do all kinds of things, and praying, and, and rituals, and all of this stuff. If you go inside of it, I went inside of it, you have to take your shoes off, and, and you know, because they're there, this is a holy place. And, and what this rock, what, what, they, what they will tell you that this is, this Dome of the Rock, it's built over a rock. When you go inside there, there's a wall about this big around, and I'm going to say that it's probably about as big around as this section of our sanctuary here. And, and in that, you can look over into that uh, area, and when you look over into that area, there's just a rock sticking up out of the ground. That's it. Now, here's what they say. This is the rock where Abraham was to offer Isaac. But it shouldn't have been Isaac, it should be Ishmael. And the emphasis is on Ishmael for the, remember? The other child. And so the Muslims have put their temple or their shrine, this Dome of the Rock, over this area. 
proclaiming it. And it is one of their most holy places. It's not as holy as Mecca, but it is one of their most holy places because they don't want the Jews to go any farther than now. Here's what the Jewish people have done and has been going on for quite a while. They have been digging underneath of this area and they have uncovered, they know where exactly where the temple was when it was destroyed because what they did was they don't take when they rebuild and they come in and they start this pushing everything away and start from the ground up, they just fill it all in and start from the top and go on up. And so there's centuries of debris. And so I've seen, again, I only was able to go into a certain part of that. But on the, on the one side of the Wailing Wall, you could go in as you're facing the Wailing Wall this way. On this side here to your left. You can see the arch, what used to be an arch of the old city of Jerusalem, and they dug that all out. And you can go down inside there, and uh, they, they will only let you go so far because they don't want the Muslim world to know all that they've uncovered. There are plans not only for them to rebuild a temple in this area, but there's plans for them also. They are in, enabling, they have studied the Old Testament scriptures, they're putting together uh, for a high priest. They're putting the garments just like they had in the Old Testament. And for the Jewish people, their thinking is that they would start offering sacrifices one day again in the temple, not, not realizing that the Messiah has come. This seven years of tribulation, this time in this passage here is a time where the nation will be attacked and it will be attacked, attacked and they will be destroyed. There will be some of them toward the end of this time some of the Jewish people and others in the world during the seven years of tribulation that will recognize and realize Jesus is the Messiah. And so what we find in this passage of Scripture is Jesus ends this, this teaching. He gives them some warnings. You're going to hear of all kinds of things that's going on. You've got to be very careful about all of this kind of stuff. And he talks about the, uh, the, uh, that there will be happening during the Great Tribulation period. Uh, notice what he says here. He says, For then there will be the Great Tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no and never will be. You know, there are those that have said all of this has already happened. I'm just telling you, there are those within Christianity that have said this has already happened. Jesus came back. We're living in the millennium. There are those that would believe as to what we would have. There are premillennialists, postmillennialists, and amillennialists. The amillennialists, the reason it has the A ah or an A in front of it, is it's the Greek letter for a negative that says no millennium. There's not going to be a millennium. That that's just that's not literal. That that's not what it really means. And some would say, no, all of these things happened when Jerusalem was destroyed. All of this uh, uh, took place already. But the problem is, if that's the case, John missed it. Because John was alive after, uh, after the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. And he wasn't taken up. And when did our Lord come back? When, when has there ever been a time? When have these signs ever been fulfilled that we're reading about here? See, we have to look at these from the perspective of what the Scriptures are saying and what Jesus is saying, not just trying to assume that some of these things have happened. Yes, we've seen destruction many, many ways. We've seen turmoil, and for years we've heard of Jesus is coming back. Look at the condition of our world. But we never, never have we accelerated so fast into the future, and then never have we seen some of these things. I mean, you think about this. Uh, what would your grandparents, some of you had grandparents here, great-grandparents would have thought when I could say, you know what, the day will come when I can take and I can talk to you and I can see your face on my phone. They would have said, you're a nutcase. Who would have thought the day would come when our grandparents would have thought, we're going to be buying, buying water out of a plastic, a paying for it. When I was a kid, I drank water with a dipper out of the well, and we all shared the same dipper. None of us had any serious problems. We look at this and we say, look at the world, how fast. And as I shared with you before about um, the, the, the RFID chip being implanted, this, this is no longer a, 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 you know, some type of a conspiracy theory. It's already happening in places. 
And so Jesus is, is telling them, if those days had not been cut short, I believe it's cut short by a seven-year period, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, these days will be cut short. It's in God's timetable. Remember, history is His story. God's story. And so all of history, you see how God has worked and the wonderful uh, uh, the ways that God has been at work around our world. And human society faces a time that's going to be more earth-shattering than any other experience before. It will be frightful, terrible, devastating. And it is coming. Jesus refers to it as a great tribulation time. Now, another thing Jesus refers to here, and very quickly I'll go through these, is a subtle deception that will be taking place. So it's already, we already see the, the fruits of these kind of things. Uh, Jesus says here in these next verses, He says, then if anybody says to you, look, here is the Christ, the Messiah, or there He is, do not believe it. So if they say, look, uh, He's in the wilderness, don't, don't go out there. If they say, look, He's in the inner room, do not believe it. I can tell you that at the end of the second and third century, a Roman priest calculated that Jesus would return in A.D. 500. His predictions was based on the dimensions. He took all the dimensions of Noah's Ark and put them together. And he said, surely God saved the world uh, by, the, by this Ark, put these dimensions together. He'd come up with the number 500. And he said, Jesus is coming back in A.D. 500. Well, it didn't happen. In the year 1000, it would have been the first millennium. Again, let me just point out to you, if those that believe a millennium took place already, 1,000 years later, there were those who said, uh, Christians that were in Europe, that Jesus is coming back on January the 1st, 1,000 A.D. And so what they did was in, uh, in 999 A.D., they gathered together groups of militant Christians and went into the pagan countries and forced them to receive Christ. Jesus didn't come back then. In the Middle Ages, Pope Innocent III took the number 618, the year Islam was founded, and they were fighting against Islam at that time, and added the number 666 and come up with the year 1284. Uh, again, these are, this is... Jesus is coming back in 1284. We should be looking for him. You could go on and on and on. Joseph Smith in 1835, the founder of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, changed their name a couple times because of all the persecution they got, but they still hold the same doctrines and the same teachings. Occult, it's false. He announced that Jesus would return in 56 years. That would have been, uh, he was, uh, that was in 1832. Uh, when, he, when, when he said that, and, and so he was saying that in 1890, um, that, that would take place. Well, he didn't live that long because he was killed, but Jesus didn't come back in 1890. In 1874, another guy that we see the, still the after effects of him, Charles Russell, was the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, started predicting the rapture of the church in 1910. It didn't happen then, so he moved it on up. And to 1914, and he said Jesus did come. It was an invisible, uh, an, an invisible return of Jesus. That's exactly what some have said about the millennium in 70 A.D. Jesus did come back. It was just a, an invisible return. You know what it is? Hogwash. It's not true. It was no invisible return. He's coming back in a bodily form. The Apostle John said, "When we see him, we'll see him as he is." The Bible tells us that, uh, uh, and, and I'm going to share with you the difference between the rapture of the church and the second coming of Jesus. There are two completely different events, and the Bible lays them out plain. They are almost opposites when we look at those. That's why we believe there is a return of Christ coming. And Russell gave these kind of predictions. Even up into our modern age that we're living right now, there's all kinds of groups of people. There was a guy by the name of Lee Ream who... Uh, uh, had a church that was uh, in um, uh, 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 that was called the uh, Mission for the Coming Days, and and he said Jesus is coming back in Sydney Harbor. Jesus is go to Sydney Harbor in Australia. He collected four point one million dollars. Jesus didn't return, and he never has returned either. He's living somewhere with these four point one million dollars. 
In 1998, there was a cult that claimed that Jesus would return and invite the faithful followers aboard a UFO. Groups of people gathered to find a UFO. It didn't, it didn't happen. In 1998, there was a group, and, and um, this, this group took the, the number 666 and it times it by three and came up with the year 1998. It's like and he said that um, in one of these statues of a lion that has the focus of a bird, um, the Sphinx in, in Egypt, that Jesus is going to come back and he will, he will, we will find the plans in between the paws of this, uh, this creature in, in Egypt. And we're also going to find other very important documents. Well, these things have been going on for years. These are all signs that, yes, Jesus is coming and we do see these kind of things. Notice what Jesus says for false Christ. False prophets will arise, perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. This is what I want to say to you very quickly, uh, that you understand these kind of things. And those of you who are, who are watching uh, at home, this is where you have to be very careful. Everything you hear on TV through satellite and so forth needs to be checked out and thoroughly run through the Word of God. It may sound, it may sound believable, but where, what, what, where is the reference? Where is this coming from? Where are we seeing these kind of things? And you will find that many of them, many of them are just speculations and assumptions. Now here, the return of Jesus is found here in these few verses that we have remaining here. And I just want to give this to you and let us look at it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. It's an unmistakable return. It is. People, at, at this point, the world will see and the world will understand. Do you realize that when the rapture takes place, the world's going to be standing around going, what happened? Where'd they go? That's what the Bible gives that picture. But not at the second coming. The entire world will know just as lightning flashes uh, in the, uh, it comes from the east and it goes to the west, and then he mentions, he gives the mention, just as when you see vultures of, of flying over a dead carcass, you know something's dead. And the emphasis isn't that, okay, we're going to be seeing something dead on that day. The emphasis is that it is a certainty that something is happening. You see it with your eyes, you know it's a reality. It's true. It's going to happen. That's what, that's what Jesus is trying to emphasize to them uh, in these passages. And that's, that's important. Notice what he says here. As, a, as an unmistakable sign, immediately after the tribulation of those days, at the end of the seven-year period, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Jesus gives a vivid, clear-cut, concise picture of the most... Uh, the most exciting event of all of all time, his second coming. These are things that will accompany that. It, it will be it will be his signs of the coming end of the coming age. And then and then notice what he goes ahead and says here. He says, "Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Why will they mourn? For many of them have rejected." the truth of the gospel, and they'll realize at that moment it is true. Just like the illustration he gives a little bit later about Noah. Do you think there were not those who were saying, I believe now, Noah, as they were swimming to save their lives? Prior to that time, it says, oh, that is foolishness. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the cloud of heaven with power and great glory and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. That day is coming. There's signs in the heavens and so forth, and we see them all over. Now, here, here's the thing that I want you to, to focus on, I want you to think about. And uh, Rich is going to come, he's going to lead us in a song of invitation. My wife and I have been out in the jungle for quite a while, for about four years. And our helicopter was broken down. The only way we could get in and out of there, and we needed to get out. Our kids needed to go back to a mission school and so forth. And I'll never forget that there was a charter 
uh, helicopter company that uh, said, well, we're going to be coming through your area in the, in, in, the, in the very near future, within that week that you're wanting to get out. Now, we can't tell you exactly when we're going to be coming. But this is what we're going to say. If you want to go, you can get out. We will land and we can only land for 10 minutes because we'll just have enough fuel for 10 minutes of landing there. So that means you have to be absolutely ready when you hear the helicopter coming. You've got to be out at the landing strip uh, on the side of this mountain where we get cleared some trees in an area for the helicopter to land, and you get in and you leave. It has to be that, I mean, that, that quick. You can't wait. And so they said it's going to be sometime this week, and so what we did, because we had our old bush clothes on. Those are clothes that won't dry because you're in the jungle, and it rains every day, and they're kind of mildew and moldy and smelly. And so we had good clothes. My, even though my, wash, my, my wife washed the clothes, did the best we could at washing those clothes, they just would not dry in the jungle. And so here we are out there living in this condition. And we had good clothes that she put some kind of a fabric softener sheet in, and we had them sealed up. And so when it was time for us to leave, because who wants to arrive out on the mission base smelling like mold? No one. So we were going to, we, we had our clothes all, we put them on, we washed and had our good clothes put on. And we, and we gave assignments to each of our kids. And my, my wife had certain things that as soon as we heard the helicopter coming, we would immediately get up. We would run to our station, get all of this stuff taken care of, get everything ready, grab our suitcases. And by the time the helicopter was to land, we would get in it. We're all dressed up, ready to go. Everything, we are prepared, uh, completely prepared, ready for that moment, that time. Well, it didn't come the first day. And we played about as many games of Monopoly as you can play. You know, those are long games. Uh, most of the place where we were mad at each other, because some won and some didn't. And then we, uh, we played, put, put puzzles together. We did all, the second day, didn't come. And you know, on the third day, it's kind of like, I don't think he's going to come. And we started growing just a little bit lax. Some of you have grown real lax in the fact you've heard Jesus is coming, but you're not ready. Oh, I've got time. I'll be able to do that at another time. And we got a little bit lax. I don't know if we got out of our good clothes. After four days of wearing good clothes. It's the best you had. Okay? Better than the mold. Okay? And so our kids were kind of, we, we weren't even letting our kids go out because they play in the huts with the tribal people and it was all smoky and they, you know, and so... We were very careful about what they were doing because we wanted to be ready, prepared. We sang about it. Corey sang about it. Remember the first song that we sang about the coming of the Lord and that it would be like a bride down the road here real shortly. Dylan is going to be walking down an aisle and he'll take his place. And before long, the preacher will stand up and he'll say, All rise. And you hear that music. Da -da -da -da. Da -da -da -da. I forget the words. Okay, and then she comes walking down. Now, he's not worried about the music. At that time, he's not worried about the candles, whether they all lit or not. He's not worried about if everybody is in place, his eyes are fixed right on her, the bride. Is coming. She's all prepared. I've never seen an ugly bride in all the weddings I've done. Some have seen some clothes, but not quite. Okay, but no. I just say this. Let me just tell you. That bride does everything she can in getting herself ready for that special day. Jesus has done everything. He said, be ready, be prepared, be watching. That helicopter did come when it came. We quickly did everything we needed to. Matt's job was to shut all the windows, make sure they were all boarded up like they needed to be. Kelly had 
her, she was just a, a, a young girl there, and she, she got her little backpack of stuff and got it all ready, and Karen did her things, and I did my things, and I was the last one. I, I locked our door as we uh, put the padlock on it, and I walked out carrying the suitcases. The helicopter comes in, it lands, and we take off, and boy, what a joy of just thinking. We're going to have a two or three weeks of rest and relaxation, and there'll be Cokes and, and candy bars and ice cream that we can eat, and it'll be a wonderful thing. And the day will come when the trumpet will, will sound and, and the dead in Christ will rise and, and we'll meet our Lord in the air. And what a day it will be. It'll be a, a glorious day. Will you be there? Is your name in the book? Because if it's not, you're not going. And you'll be left behind. You'll be wondering, well, what happened to them? And in these next passages, the two working, one's taken and one's left. Who's sleeping in a bed. One's taken, one's left. A husband or a wife that, that wasn't ready, they weren't prepared. Then we, we have in the next chapter the, the story of, of, of ten virgins, five who were prepared and ready, and five who wasn't and were left. A picture of the rapture. Jesus is coming. Are you ready? As Rich leads us in a song this morning, my prayer for you, and this week, as I thought, and I too was sitting in a hotel room, not not wanting it to be just a time of a, enjoying a tropical uh, area and enjoying coconut ice cream and and, uh, and and those kind of things. But I tried to be uh, faithful in the Word and praying, praying for you, praying for the service, because some of you are not ready, and you need to get ready. You hear the sound? I hear the sound. It may be at a distance, but let me see the signs. Will you be left behind? Let's stand together as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask for your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. Draw us to yourself. Father, may not one person here today leave without knowing that you're the Lord of their life. If there's a concern... If there's a doubt, then I pray, Father, that this morning those that have ears to hear have heard. And as your Spirit is drawing them, that they'll not turn you away, but they will come. They will kneel, Father, at a place to say, Lord Jesus, I want to know that my name's written in the book of life. So, Father, we pray this morning they'll respond in obedience as you're calling, calling out their names for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray.